Judge Joe Brown. I want to say welcome back. I never knew TV. Glad to have you here. Um, we want to get right into it, right? And the question that everyone is concerned about is migration. All right, um, immigrants in America. I have heard numerous theories about why the American government is providing so much support to immigrants while many Americans are homeless and housing insecure. Um, what do you think is fueling this mass movement of financial support for newly arrived immigrants in American cities? They're not immigrants, they're illegals. And what's going on is very simple. You have this situation set up by Article I of the U.S. Constitution. It says every 10 years there shall be a census conducted, the primary purpose of which is to determine the apportionment of representatives in the House of Representatives. We call them congressmen, in other words. So I participated in no less than five census takings as an adult. This last one in 2020 was the first one. They did not ask whether I was a citizen or not. Also, it's the first one where they did not inquire as to the status of my parents, what their status was. See, heretofore what went on is they said these are the citizens, this is the population of the United States, and we have another category of people who are not citizens. This time, for 2020, they combined them. What's the purpose? Well, so California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, etc., will not lose congressional representation and will perhaps gain representatives. In other words, if you build up the population of California, they maintain the current number of congressmen, or they might gain one or two, but the people that are being counted toward this gain or retention cannot vote. So... There are what I call local yokels, New York and a few other places, California, places like San Francisco, where they have an Asian who is not a citizen who's sitting on, of all things, the election commission to determine uh, for San Francisco how the votes are counted and such like. There are locals that are trying to generate this thing. They also are trying to bring in people who are susceptible to a new agenda, which is to impose the rainbow cult on the country. It is a new religion, and in order to understand its religious nature, contemplate Buddhism. Buddhism is an ancient and honorable religion, but it does not have a deity, no God. Same thing with LGBTQIA. Not homosexuality, but this cult that's represented by the rainbow. You cannot teach Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism in an American public school, but you can teach rainbow. Uh, kids get taken to Sunday school, the church by their mothers, and they sit through bored to tears for an hour or two hours uh, a few Sundays out of the month, and by the time they are six, seven, eight, nine, they are devout believers in whatever the religion happens to be, whether they went to church, synagogue, or mosque, or temple. But what you have is the rainbow being imposed six hours a day, five days a week, preschool all the way through 12th grade. So they are indoctrinating people in this rainbow thing. And it is a system of philosophy that deals with nihilism. In other words, self-hate. You don't like what you are. You want to be something else. There are no standards, duty, honor, obligation, responsibility, accountability, purpose, cause, morality, ethics. All of that goes out of the window. And you get rid of those guiding principles that have controlled and directed humanity since we've been here, you get rid of shame and guilt. Oh, my God, we have to get rid of shame. Somebody dealing with shame online. Oh, my God. And you see, when you get this kind of thing, you get rid of the human control mechanism. Shame is good. Guilt is good. It causes people to behave. But we've got this cult that's attempting to put this in place. So what they're trying to do is recruit followers. And that's why politics looks so crazy today is because it's not about the ordinary things, which are what 
do you get for your vote? What kind of economic background or environment are you creating? What kind of thing about the options that a government will exercise? You're getting in place this thing where the primary elements are destruction of masculinity, where it's anti-manhood, anti-womanhood, anti-childhood, anti-nuclear family and setting up something else. The prototype that you're getting in place to run this, you can see by what's going on down in Georgia right now. Fannie Willis is a classic example, the poster child for what's supposed to be imposed on us in terms of leadership. That's whether you're talking about Maxine Waters, Nancy Pelosi, whether you're talking about uh, Cory Booker, whether you're talking about Lori Lightfoot. Uh, this is what is to be put in place. It's not affirmative leadership. It's administration to push an agenda. And see what we're getting away from in our cities is the leadership that can get out on a street and say, follow me, and people will go along behind. Judge, I have a quick question, right? So what do they plan on doing with the citizens that are already here? Screw them. <laughs> you know, like Richard Pryor joked, 40-something years ago, he said, they're getting them some new Negroes. I don't use that N-word, but new Negroes, so to speak. And we also have another thing, too, going on here. One of the big problems right now is we have surplus labor, and there are not enough jobs to go around on a level commensurate with the expectations of the public in terms of what people ought to earn. So there is a concurrent movement to acclimate people to being dependent and taken care of so they don't want to work. And two, to get rid of what surplus, you put them in the labor warehouse, which is known as a penitentiary, and additionally, you have a problem because there are some entry-level employment positions that you do need to get filled. And when the process of cutting people out of this labor market through their own mental attitudes works, you get, hey, man, I ain't flipping no burgers for no Mickey D's, man. I got my B's and H's, man. They take care of me. And what you need still is somebody to fill that function. Now, in terms of illegals, I had a ranch out in California at one time. You could always tell when the subcontractors had brought in illegals to do work. They showed up early. They didn't take the morning break. They got an hour for lunch. They take 20 minutes. They don't take the afternoon break. And they stay two hours extra. And since it's a ranch and you all always had fruit trees around, they'd ask if they could bring a couple of coolers of cervezas, beer, and have a couple of limes. And they'd have a happy hour and they'd have a player and they'd be out by the barn somewhere doing this. And they would get the work done in half the time. Meanwhile, they're uncles and nephews and cousins and brothers who were citizens would be as lazy as anybody else. So they need some effective labor. So that comes in. And then see, the other problem is, is computerization and indu industrial technology have made a whole lot of people obsolete. For the first time in human history, your labor doesn't count because they've got a machine that can do it better. So what happens is, what do you do when you have a surplus in your labor units, meaning your workers? Think of labor as a commodity, like wheat, corn, or cotton. When you get a glut in a commodity market, there are three things you do. One, you cut back production. Two, you subsidize the would-be producer. And three, you store the surplus. And perhaps a fourth thing, find an alternative use for the thing. All right, when it comes to labor, you store the surplus not in a grain silo. You store it in a jail cell instead of a grain silo. Uh, the subsidy is welfare check. Cutting back a production 
is you get the youth to ideate on the wrong things that are dysfunctional. In other words, they drop out, bang out, drug out, get knocked up too early, too often, develop inappropriate attitudes, outlooks, worldviews. They don't have any vocational skills. They don't have any educational academic uh, foundation to go further. They clown, carry on, and make where they live islands of chaos so those islands cannot engage in collective political self-help. Uh, people can't go out because they're worried about getting ripped off, robbed, raped, or whatever the case may be. Now, part of that process is getting a person to think in the wrong kind of fashions. And you can see it right now where we get this woke thing where everybody whines about white supremacy holding you down. Well, when you get people to thinking that they can't do anything because something has held them down and they blame this something without being able to focus on what's necessary to counter it, then you have achieved your goal. You have made them think of themselves as impotent, so they are unable to function, and they acquiesce in what's going on, and they just bitch about it. Man, white supremacy holding us down, man. Like, you know, uh, they, they going to do everybody like they did Black Wall Street, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, see, 55 years ago in the late 1960s, people were talking about black power, you know, power to the people. Get out of my way, I'll do it myself. Now everybody's talking about when you're going to cut the check. Reparations would not be a bad thing, but it's kind of like saying, hey, if I just win the big lottery, everything's going to be all right. Yeah, of course it would be, but what are your chances of winning it? And why do you insist on voting for a party that is diametrically opposed to granting you what you want because they've got another agenda that they want you to fit into and support that has nothing to do with you? You're getting pimped. Yeah, that's like a whole selling behind, you know, like what she got out the deal. All money back in part. She earned it. The pimp's using it. Gives her a little bit back and claims he's protecting her when he's exploiting her. And Lord knows I used to represent enough pimps and hoes 40-something years ago when I was in private practice. So, like, uh, long term, right, or not even long term, in the near future, next three, five years, what will the American landscape look like when all the support is given to illegal immigrants and the natives aren't getting any support or they're struggling financially? In they the don't survival? care. See, they have this new religion they're imposing on you. And it's like whether you're talking about when Christianity spread, Islam spread, or whatever the religion may be that's spreading, you get this zeal where the important thing is the imposition of the religion. You get the Hundred Years' War, you get the Protestant, Catholic uh, chaos, you get Torquemada back in Spain in the 16th century with the Inquisition, you get witches burnt at the stake, so to speak, you get messes like you have going on in the Middle East, and it becomes a matter of uh, whose version of heaven is better and who's going to help out who to go find out whether somebody was lying, mistaken, or they were true. So that becomes the overriding purpose, not any practical goals. We're not talking about economy here. We're not talking about world power here. We're talking about a way of life, of nihilism. In other words, instead of I'm black and I'm proud, it's I hate being black, so I want to be something else. And it's like, I don't want to be a man. You hear that, you know, and he's got a beard and he wants to be called ma'am instead of sir. And he sissies up and he abandons one half of the balance sheet between male and female that has gone on since we were in caves or down on the savannah somewhere in southern Africa. So we get this abandonment of what has gotten us from cave to condominium. 
and it all goes to hell. You've got Jovene Moise. He was the president of Haiti. He was assassinated in 2021. You've got the current prime minister, Ariel Henry. He's in Puerto Rico right now. He's stranded. He can't get back. Yamin Cherizier, that's Jimmy Cherizier. He is an ex-cop who is the chief gangster in Haiti. He's a gang leader, Mr. Barbecue. <laughs> Mr. Barbecue, yeah. Literally, he has had himself recorded eating a piece of somebody that's stripped and cooked. All right, you've got Guy Philippe. Now, he's an interesting person. The U.S. released him from custody November last year. He had been in custody since 2017. He is a national hero because way back, he was the leader of an anti bertrand Arist uh, coup. That was somebody that got overthrown in 2004. So this hero of the Haitian people has been kept off stage and he looks like he's the only one that could come in with the authority to put things in check. And in Haiti right now, you've got a situation that mirrors what you have in American cities. The administration is not the strong power that can say, follow me, that can intimidate, apply physical power, force, and get things done. It has essentially been an administration propped up by the U.S. government with a great interest in maintaining the credibility of the Clintons. So that means suppression of a large number of things that needed to be corrected. So you have a weak person that cannot say, follow me, who has been turned against. Now, there is another thing that they're trying to keep under wraps, and that is the current prime minister used to be pro-gangs. He was their flunky. Now they turned on him because he couldn't provide the necessary leadership. And what he had done was taken himself over to Kenya, where he was going to get a contingency of Kenyan military to come in and occupy Haiti and bestow order on Haiti in sort of a martial law situation conducted by foreign interest, which does not go over well with the Haitians. Now, see, there is a need for Haitians to get strong government again. Uh, my brother I was talking about, the late Clifford Stewart of Los Angeles, and I had to set up an international rescue detail uh, a certain beautiful young lady we knew was doing a documentary series over there in Haiti after the earthquake, and she stumbled onto a Catholic convent where the black nuns were taking female orphans and selling them into sex slavery or conducting actual prostitution rings out of the convent. She was covering this, and they were trying to kidnap her, so we had to take some steps to have stop this from happening. Now that kind of thing is endemic in Haiti right now, and it got exploited according to the Haitians by the likes of the Clintons at one point in time for their economic, well the Clintons' economic benefits. I don't know if that was Bill Clinton, but it certainly would be an implication of Hillary. We have that kind of thing where we have a power vacuum, just like we have in the cities of America where we have administrators, but we don't have leaders. And you have street gangs taking control of a circumstance like they did in Chicago. Lori Lightfoot pulled off one of the damn dumbest stunts I've ever seen. She wanted to get street credibility by helping out what she thought were community organizations. So she put up a lot of money with what she thought were Hispanic community organizations, but they turned out to be street gangs. 
They used the money to buy up arms that were hijacked from several boxcars that were in the IC rail yard, which, considering what they got, would contribute significantly to the armaments out in the streets. So that left black street gangs at the mercy of brown street gangs, which caused some dealings to go on for an armaments race in Chicago. So now you've got a situation where the administration in Chicago doesn't run Chicago. It's the street gangs, but then in opposition to the illegal immigrants who have come in, now you have the people organizing and taking their own power and saying, hell no, we don't want you. And uh, dealing with the non-effective administration effectively taking back control for the people. It's an interesting thing. And our leadership is not like this man, Bob Marley. You go down to Jamaica and they feature him in the Jamaica National Museum. And if you see the movie Marley, they stick pretty close to what's going on. He resists the temptation to just make money because he's about the principles that Rasta stands for, which are advancement of the people. And you must have purpose, principle, and you must have cause. And he devoted his music to, to that, and he turned down a lot of just money-making opportunities to do that, and he became a national hero because he faced danger. If you look at the movie, they tread very lightly on it, but there were several assassination attempts because he was saying things that a lot of people didn't want said and that some of the street gangs did not want in place while he was trying to get his music together because he used it to convey a message. We do not have that now for the most part. His glorification of pimps, hoes, all kinds of wrongdoing, drug dealing, and did general dysfunction and disorder. That's not cool. But you see, this is a difference between somebody who's leadership. Leadership is about a point. Leadership is about a principle. So when you look at our urban leadership now, what do they stand for? Law and order? No. Are they standing for the family? No, they're for destruction of the traditional nuclear family. Are they about the standards of manhood and masculinity? No, they're against purpose and uh, cause, no shame, uh, no guilt, and anything goes. So in other words, our leadership essentially is trying to destroy the things that have caused humans or enabled humans to have order so they can manifest progress so they can manifest peace, so they can manifest prosperity, so they can manifest dealing with their primary function. So what is humanity's primary function? Well, when we read history, what are we reading? About dead people that came before us. So if I can tell a joke and I'll clean it up, anytime you see a person, what are you looking at? Answer, a successful screw. <laughs> somebody got born, somebody grew up, somebody matured, somebody courted, somebody had a successful screw. Nine months later, somebody popped out. And now they get raised and they court, they screw. If it's successful, something else pops out and it keeps going. So the fundamental purpose is the next generation or the generations thereafter. And when you have something that ignores what is required to keep that in progress, you sort of kind of lead yourself down the road to extinction or to irrelevancy because we have the Chinese, we have the Russians, we have the Africans, we've got the South Americans, we've got the Caribbeans, We've got everybody in the world except Western Europe and the United States and Canada trying to deal with the things that have gotten us from cave to condo. 
manhood, womanhood, childhood, and the interaction between the three of them to make their uh, tomorrow for humanity. Folk who during the civil rights era, era were frankly embarrassments. They were down on their knees while some redneck was beating them across the head until some other redneck felt guilty about it. That's not a struggle. That's getting your ass whipped. See, and there's a thing that they don't report about that era. A whole lot of the black men who were veterans from Korea, World War II, and some of the old ones who had been in World War I, and he even had a few old brothers who had been Buffalo soldiers on the frontier because you still had people alive in the 1950s who had been alive in the 1870s, 1880s. And their attitude was, I fought danger, I've risked death, and I'll be damned if I'm gonna let somebody beat me across my head until they feel guilty about it. Raise the hand to me and you're not gonna bring a hand back. You see, we, we forgot about that and we fell for the propaganda that was put on us. Um, I know 50 some years ago, I was with a DC think tank as an intern. And I know we had to go through 60 some thousand pages of the congressional record. And this was about the Voting Rights Act of 64, not Voting Rights, Civil Rights Act of 64 as amended in the Voting Rights Acts and employment stuff too. I think there were maybe four or five pages that discussed nonviolent demonstrations. Most of the rest of it was reaction to, I call the three Bs, burn, baby, burn. When black folk were burning down the cities in America, Chicago, 64, Los Angeles, 65, et cetera, et cetera. And the question was, is why are the Negroes doing this? Why are the black people doing this? What happened? We've got to stop this. What do they need so we can bring them into this? They weren't concerned about somebody peacefully uh, doing what they did. So we forgot that. And there is this intense frustration that has been misled for a half century into self-destruction rather than doing something to direct your aggression and hostility toward an achievable goal. We have been led astray and to a great extent what we have is the results of what was happening in the late 60s. There was a war going on that was very unpopular, the NAM, and you had a coalition, you had females who hated that they were not men some of the feminists. You had females who hated men, some of the lesbians. You had weak men that hated they weren't strong men. You had some gay men who hated they weren't normal men. And you had a collection, a large collection that assumed war was because of men. So this coalition wound up getting in control of the communications industry. They already practically had control of the entertainment industry. They took over the political industry and they took over the advertising industry and news industries. So what happens is there was a thing that gave them power. Late 60s, every Thursday and every Sunday, Every movie theater in America, and there were many, many more then than now, would have two new movies, cartoons, and several side features. Didn't make any difference whether the movie was a hit or a flop. Every, two, every Thursday and every Sunday, they'd change. And color television was driving them out of business. You could go in and spend 50 cents, and you could walk in anytime you wanted in the middle of a movie or otherwise, stay through the next one, pick up on the parts you missed, and then go out or stay there all night long. 
So they're going broke. So they got this bright idea of let's see how long a movie will last. And instead of 50 cents to see two plus the extras, extras, you spend a dollar and a half, which today would be about $40 for one ticket. And you had to walk in on time and you left when the movie was over. And who are you gonna bring in? Well, there's this great huge audience of people that was hungry to see themselves. Let's go get these black folk, these Afro-Americans who are anxious to spend money to see themselves. But let's not deal with the Sidney Poitier thing. Let's not deal with uh, uh, uplifting self. Let's deal with pimps, hoes, drug dealers, murderers, and thieves so we can appeal to the lowest common denominator. Came up with stuff like the Black Caesar with Fred the Hammer Williams, who was a football player, and he played a gangster, a drug dealer who was a hit man, and he became the hero, and he prospered. Everybody that saw the movie that was grown said, wait a minute, what time is this where, you know, you got this villain comes out as the hero? you never seen anything like that because Hollywood had previously been working on, you know, we have gangsters, we look at them, but it's like crime doesn't pay. Okay. Now, then you, not long after Black Caesar, you got Superfly, where the hero was a drug dealer, and he prospered. You got Foxy Brown with Pam Greer, and she was a good-looking woman, but every time you had the movies and you were on the West Coast or the East Coast, what you saw was she got knocked down, knocked out five or six times, and the titties would bounce out, or you'd see a twat. And there would be four or five uh, butt naked white women just got out to shower for some reason would still be wet with a towel across their shoulders would walk through the living room where the black men would be in there showing ham acting, uh, which wasn't even good acting. And the plot would be the same. Uh, Sister takes control because her brother got killed by some drug dealers, so she wants revenge. Then it morphed into sister takes control because brother who was a drug dealer got killed by some other drug dealers, so she wants to be the drug dealing chief. So they started glamorizing the dysfunction. And now it's about pimping. Pimp your ride. You know, it's about pimping, man. You know, like how many you got working for you, man? Like, I ain't flipping no buggers at Mickey D's, man. I got my B's and H's, man. They works for me, takes good care of me. That's disgusting. 50 years ago, about the only thing below a pimp in social status or stature was a pedophile. In fact, from representing a lot of them, Pimp suck more dick in the penitentiary than anybody in there except the convicted pedophiles. They were at the bottom of the heap. Now everybody in my mouth pimping, man, you know, like you want to be a pimp? What's wrong with you? A man is supposed to protect the womanhood and the childhood in his community, and here you are exploiting it. And your mama act like a hoe. Is that where you got the idea from? You know, and then look at some of the stuff you see on social media, all the windmilling, non-fighting violence where the women just get totally out of control. Remember, these females are not acting like women because women, woman, just like man, is not a status. It's an earned title. Male and female is a status. Man, woman requires some behavioral constraints that you have to rise to. You have to do the things that men are supposed to do that women are supposed to do. But we have gotten away from that because we aren't proud of what we are. We try to be ashamed of it and be something else. Now, that is one of the big problems we have right now that's not just black folk. It's this whole society. And interestingly enough, we have something to oppose. The stuff that got us from 
cave to condo still works because we are in a safety bubble that's about to pop. Here in the United States and in Western Europe since World War II, we haven't had any barbarians coming in from the fringes. We haven't had any diseases that we can't get some handle on. We haven't had things where it's beyond our technological control. What our main problem has been is that in this bubble, people are trying to get rid of those elements of human nature that cause us to be what we are. And we forget some realities too, which are this. Um, what we wind up doing is forgetting that we are at the top of the food chain. And that means anything on this planet you want to eat, you can eat. Anything on this planet we do not protect is endangered. That says something about what human nature is about. We are at the top of the food chain. That means we kill better than anything else on this planet. And that includes we kill ourselves just like every other predatory beast on this, or fish or bird on this planet does when there's competition. So we have standards that have developed over a long, long period of time to control this. And when you try to get away from these things, you go wrong. What is the biggest difference between present day black men and the black men from your generation? We had principle and cause. We had a purpose. It is right now, today, we can do something about this oppression that we have suffered as a people. We are willing to die for it. Do you think it's because this generation is so selfish? Well, they have gotten propagandized so hard that they don't understand what manhood is. See, manhood is about duty, honor, obligation, accountability. You have a cause and a purpose. You can articulate that. Ask one of the young brothers what he's all about, and he'll give you something that's nihilistic, hopelessness, not a cause, not a purpose. You see, if you've got something that's on your ass, that's adversity. And when you conquer adversity, you yeah, I did it. And you brag about it. So what is it that we brag about now that we have, what did we conquer? You know, you're in Africa, 13 years old. You got to prove your worth training up to manhood from that point. Go kill your lion with your wooden spear without even an iron head on it. And the elders go to see if you got a real lion. What do we do now? Punk out. Tear up where we live. We look at a spectacle where the women are totally, well, the females are totally out of control. You see all of the videos. Somebody's camera, you know, trying to video some clown females playing girl Rilla as they're battling it out, flailing all over the place, knocking each other around. That is a disgrace. Those girls ought to be practicing being women and ladies to bestow order in people's heads. They have sons, and those sons are looking at disorder, chaos. What do you expect them to be when they grow up? There are no father figures around to model themselves on. There is no media, no voice of the village trying to push masculinity, which is about duty, honor, obligation, accountability, public order. You uh, see, we don't have these things. We've got chaos. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure you saw this. What's up with the trend of rappers painting their fingernails? Punk. Too many of them uh, are trying to be street cred. You got too many people just got out the joint used to doing the 6B thing. What 6Bs? Unbelt drop britches, drop, drop boxes, bend over, spread butt cheeks, get boy banged. And too many of them into that sissy thing. That's not manly. And see, we have to get away from that and get back to manhood. Wherever you have men, anywhere on the planet Earth, 
anywhere in human history, what you wind up with is men attempting to impose order where they live. Now, if you take the black community, do you see men attempting to impose order where they live? All right. Do you even see men in charge? Okay, there is the problem. And you see, it's not even a black-white thing. It's a universal thing in this country where you're forgetting what leadership is. If you want to see leadership, take a visit to your local zoo, go to the primate areas and watch the baboons and the chimps. And you can see politics. You can see them off behind bushes. They're cutting deals with each other. Uh, they come to blows. They bite each other. They pound each other to see who's going to be the alpha male who's gonna be in charge. And interestingly enough, what they're fighting about is where they are supposed to be living. The alpha male is closest to the leopard that wants to eat one of the rest of them. So you're fighting for being the privilege, for the privilege of to being protect. the first to die, which is interesting. And we forget that because now we have administrators who couldn't get Two people to follow them to go get an ice cream cone or have diarrhea and couldn't get them to follow them to a porta potty with a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, anyway, that's the way we are right now. See, we forget about these things. Like, which, honestly, would you follow a Lori Lightfoot into danger? Would you follow a Fanny Willis into danger? Would you follow a Maxine Waters into danger, or for that matter, would you follow that sissy type Cory Booker into danger? Would you follow an Al Sharpton into danger? You know, he, he, he looks like he wants to tremble so he can hold somebody's hand and sing, we shall overcome. Uh, look who we put up as heroes. Um, um, I want to talk about how rapes in prisons have an immense impact on the black community, right? According to reports, I know this number sounds low, but it says, uh, uh, just uh, according to reports from the Justice Department, more than 200,000 prisoners are sexually abused every year, right? When someone is raped in prison, there is a high probability that they contact some type of disease along with mental damage from that traumatic experience. How does release inmates who have been raped impact the physical and mental health of the communities they return to. Okay, I'll talk about that. I was a judge, got elected to two eight-year terms, criminal court judge in Memphis. And at the time I was presiding on the mem uh, bench in Memphis, Memphis had a dubious distinction of being number five in the nation in absolute numbers of state criminal charges that were prosecuted or resolved. It was Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Dallas, Memphis, Houston, Miami, and Detroit in that order. Now, 1991 and two, um, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, sent a special hit team to Memphis because of the extremely high incidence of HIV that had uh, developed in the penal system in Memphis. Memphis has, or Shelby County, where Memphis is located, has the dubious distinction of having more inmates than any other county in the entirety of the United States. It's got a federal maximum security facility, a state medium and minor facility, and county facilities and juvenile facilities. Well, I wound up being the administrative judge for the criminal court, so I was in charge of what was going on. And what came out, thanks to a sister who went astray, Catherine Bowers, now deceased, she got a legislative act passed that required that any somebody 18 to 25 who was locked up, sentenced, would have to be tested for STDs upon registration in the institution and upon release. 
So what CDC found out was that you were having four to six percent going in HIV positive, and after three months, 90 days, you were getting somewhere around 64, 66% HIV positive. Hold on fire. You said it went from 4% to 67%? Yeah, because what was going on is if somebody had been incarcerated for nine months, there was a 92% probability that they had engaged in either voluntary or involuntary homosexual contact with some other inmate. The bad problem was is that what was going on in, say, Memphis is in certain areas of Memphis, you had a situation where nine out of every 11 male blacks between 18 and 29 were not just on probation or parole, but were actually incarcerated. So what wound up happening is you had 11, no, you had eight out of every 13 females in the same group had the problem. But what was going on is the two out of 11 that had already done time were out there dealing with the remaining four women out of that group who were not on probation or parole. Typically women didn't get the time they got put on probation or parole more so than the guys. So you had a massive HIV problem, and I would have every last Thursday in the month reserved for petitions to suspend remainder of sentence where people were locked up in the county system where I still had jurisdiction. So I can remember one instance where I had like 23, 24 people applying for petition to suspend remainder of sentence on this one particular Thursday. And 11 of them were interesting because I'm reading their reports and they had each had homosexual contact with each other and all of them were HIV positive. So their defense lawyers wanted to approach the bench and ask me as the court not to publish this. I said I'd take it under advisement. Now, I'm listening to all of these women come in and they wanted their man back so they could take up habitation with him again and, you know, set up the family. So instead of dealing with them one at a time, I dealt with all of them and reserved ruling. And I called all of these women back up. I was pretty good with names then. So I said, Miss Thompson, Miss Jackson, Ms. Willis, uh, Ms. So-and-so, would you please come back to the uh, bar there? Said, now each of you has indicated that you wish to take back up with the individuals you have testified in support of. Is that correct, ma'am, 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 so, okay. The court has been asked not to reveal this, but the court must, in the interest of public safety, disclose to you the fact that each of these individuals that you have testified in support of is HIV positive. Four of them have active cases of AIDS. And that means, and one of them says, oh, hell no, ma'am, please, please. Uh, What that means is, is if you have sex with them, you are dead. There is no known cure. This is like 93, 94. And uh, the court feels that it must apprise you of the danger. See, but that was a regular thing. So you're looking at all of these people that are going for bad, and they've been booty busting each other. And... See, not only that, there was another thing, too, which dealt with rape. What was happening was very interesting. I'm not talking about these cases where it was a dispute over somebody said they were going to pay somebody's rent, so somebody got mad when they didn't and accused them of rape. I'm talking about when you had an actual rapist, and this has been going on longer than when I was on the bench because I was a criminal defense lawyer, so... I would have somebody that, you know, got a bogus case, you know, somebody's mad at him and then they recant the rape accusation. 
and then I've got the ones that I know actually did something, all right? Invariably, what happened to them that I knew from being their defense lawyers and what I had as a continuing situation that I had to deal with as a judge was that somebody was walking along the streets in the projects and four, five, six guys jumped him. They stuck a pistol to his head and they knocked him out, drug him into uh, an abandoned apartment in the projects. And they hadn't lost the taste for what was going on in the jail. And they raped him. Hold on. You're talking about dudes raping dudes on the street? Yeah. So they rape him. And as a matter of vengeance, to scapegoat somebody else, he would rape a woman later. Now, the other thing I knew from being a defense lawyer for a long time was this. You'd get these idiots that weren't raised right. So mama would come in at 15, when he he was 15, and retain you to represent him in juvenile proceedings. So it'd be money coming in, you know, pay your secretary, pay your rent, and all of your expenses and stuff like that. So by the time this guy got 18, 19, mama wasn't paying so much anymore. He would have four women come in. So you're getting money from four women, different women, to represent him, okay? You'd do his first serious time where he'd get, actually do 9, 10, 11, 12, 14 months and get out. The next time you saw him, it wouldn't be the four women. It would be one or two women and three dudes that were paying for him. And it was funny because over and over again, what would happen is the women would come in in a month or two, Lloyd Brown, I want my money back. Well, you can't get it back. I've signed on the jacket. What's the problem? Dad, no good, Jamal. Look, let me tell you something. I started noticing all my Kotex were gone. And then I figured out, what is butt bleeding like that for? And then I found out he was dealing with these four sissies down at the other end of the hallway in the same building I'm in and then coming down trying to deal with me. So, Judge, there's a there's a real scary part to it because uh, I'm not saying all. I don't want to be clear. Right. But there are a lot of women within our community that have a factuation with people who are in and out of prison. I know. So if you're dealing with that, remember, 92% probability if they've been in there for 14 months that they've had voluntary or involuntary homosexual conduct or contact. Uh, Sag bagged and dragged is a good indication. Your pants holding down. First time I saw that was 1980. It was July. My law partner had died behind some mess representing some people in a drug cartel, all right? So I had filed for this delayed appeal on one of his clients that I was appointed to handle, all right? It's 105 degrees. This is the main penitentiary up in Nashville, and the air conditioning had broken down in the attorney-client visitation room. So if you didn't mind being out on the yard with them. They'd let you interview them out in the yard. So I've got a yellow tablet, and I'm out there taking notes on this guy's delayed appeal. So I looked up, and I saw somebody with pants hung down off his behind and a loose shirt tied in a knot in the front. So what the hell is that? And ordinarily, since they can't wear belts, these guys get these tailored jeans and stuff. He said, oh, Lawyer Brown, it's like this, man. You mean to do with his pants hung down like that, man? It's like, look, all of us up in here doing long time of life, man, we got everything up in here except some soft booties, so we making them. That's man pussy over there. See, he doing short time, so that's the signal to everybody to bust him out, turn him out. See them over there with the dresses and the wigs and the weaves? We going to turn them into that. So see them trees over there with his pants like that, man, when the guards ain't around, we bend them down, pull them down, get down. And when he on the block, man, you know, like we don't let him wear his pants, man, and he don't get to wear no panties, that that, that shirt, that be his dress, man. We already done made him some jewelry up in metal shop, and Jamal got his baby sis sending him some mascara, rouge, lipstick, eyeshadow, and plastic nails. We girl and dude out. 
So in the 1980s, when you were sagged and bagged, that meant you're doing short time, turn, you turn him out, make the booty wide open so anybody can do it. By the 1990s, it had morphed into that person belongs to somebody important. And you saw all these dudes getting buffed out from pumping iron. That's so if anybody was busting them out, it was by choice rather than just taking it. So you get all these folks, the lower the sag, the cooler the dude. No, you just look like you've been booty busted off in the joint. This has been going on for 45, 44 years. So what is it that is being shown? See, this thing spreads through the black community. It spreads through the mainstream community. To the so, point where it's seen cool as doing time. Yeah. Like, man, you don't want to, man, tell, man, Earl, man, tell Jamal, man, he don't know what time it is, man. He got to do his time for, you know, it's a man thing, so you got to understand. No. Why do you say you have to be in the slave quarters before you can understand manhood? That's because you've never dealt with a man. See, everybody that's being a man got a job. He a little raggedy. His car is not cool. And mama's sitting up there. Uh, look here. Mama done give you all this good love. And I know you got something for me. And then he comes by there. He you better hurry up. You better get what you're going to get. You ain't going to wallow up in this for that little piece of change all night long. And he hardly got up and wiped himself off. Got to his ride parked behind the dumpster. And he's left. And mama's on the phone, baby, you know that ring you wanted down in American loan? Well, mama needs some good loving. You come over here tonight, give mama some good loving. We go shopping tomorrow. So the kid is watching somebody hustle his mama. Mama willingly gets hustled. And the guy that's got the job acting like a man, he's looking down on him. So I had a remarkable achievement, which was the statewide recidivism rate was universally about 80%. In my courtroom, it had dropped down to 18, and it was dropping when I retired in 2000. And what I was doing was showing these boys manhood and duty, honor, obligation, accountability. And 25 years later, 30 years later, I get folk walking up to me with a lot of gray hair. Judge, you remember me? No, I don't. Well, you gave me some time. Did I give you enough? Uh, yeah, but it was that manhood thing. I'm a grandfather now, and you know, all my grandchildren, I make them stay in school. I don't pay any, play that, you in school. And all my children are doing all right, and I've been married for 27 years. I want to thank you for what you did making me a man. And see, when you get people wanting to be a man, they don't tolerate all of this BS that everybody else says is normal. Well, not everybody, but too many say is normal because they've been propagandized. See, it used to be, well, Hillary Clinton bastardized something. She said, it is the responsibility of the village to raise the children, all right? That's a takeoff from a Yoruba proverb that says, oh, warrior or hunter, Fear not if you die in the cause of your people because your sons will be raised to manhood by your village to take your place. Manhood, not just raising children. And you see, our whole society now has been corrupted by toxic masculinity. And that comes from the late 60s when I used to hear all across the country you know, Black Student Alliance, we travel around and you'd hear these speeches about toxic masculinity. All masculinity is toxic and evil. Therefore, we must do something to change the way boys are raised to men. So you have unisex child rearing, unisex child clothing. Boys play with dolls, no war toys, cap guns, water pistols, or anything like that. It's all right for boys to cry, to be emotional. And the last damn thing you need is an emotional addition of the apex predator on the planet Earth that kills better than anything else walking, flying, or swimming, or slithering through the, the countryside. Are American cities uh, 
no longer able to deal with them with managing all right let me start from time are american cities no longer able to deal with managing gun violence because you spoke about you just spoke about how emotional our young men are and it just seems like the gun violence is just out of hand but has american cities lost control it's not really gun violence it's you're not controlling the violence in the male element guns swords spears arrows war clubs rocks they've been with humanity since day one if you took the 250,000 years that uh, paleontologists say there have been anatomically modern humans around, you can take all of that time period and get up to the last 150 years and the typical man would be armed. So we grew up with armaments. And you see, the thing about armaments is this, a gun a spear, a sword, a knife is no more than the fangs that gorillas have, the fangs that chimpanzees have, the fangs that your dog has, the fangs that your cat has, that lions have, that wolves have, that bear have. You see, we lost those and Guns are but a replacement for the canine teeth that all other mammal predators have or the shark beaks that bird predators like eagles and hawks have or the claws and long conical teeth that alligators, crocodiles, and stuff like uh, monitor lizards have. You see, those are our weapons. That's how we stay at the top of the food chain so we don't have to worry about stuff having us for breakfast, lunch, dinner, or a midnight snack. You see, we live for most of our existence in a real live horror movie where you are asleep and you get mildly disturbed because you hear something sounded like something being drugged and you didn't pay attention until you woke up that morning and found that your neighbor who was sleeping under the furs next to you is gone and you find blood trails where something big snatched him out of the hovel and decided to eat him. So this is our reality and we can't get around it. Now, I've taken martial arts since 1966. My brother was listed by Black Belt Magazine as probably the most dangerous human alive in North America for 15 years. We taught each other stuff. Real quick, what's your brother's name? Clifford Stewart, now late Clifford Stewart. You can look him up online. He's known as the bodyguard for stars. Now, in addition to having a literal PhD he had 14 black belts in karate, 10th Dan in nine of them. He was uh, he had a black belt in judo, another one in jujitsu. He was a kung fu grandmaster. He had something called Within Arms Reach, acronym WAR. And I think five of his students were on SEAL Team 6 when they pulled off the Bin Laden raid. And he was also one of the three pendeckers in the whole world for an Indonesian thing called Pinat Sila. So a, a person like that, he can't get in any type of altercations, right? Anything is attempted uh, murder? I won't talk about that, but yeah. I've been studying with him for 55 years, all right? My specialty was shooting. His was literally, he also became co-executive producer on my show and he had that background too. So the CIA would literally send representatives down there every few weeks to consult with him on unarmed killing or knife killing. And if you wanna see one of his knife techniques, there's a movie called Under Siege starting, starring Tommy Lee Jones and Steven Seagal. Seagal is the ex-seal who's the cook. They were on a battleship and they're doing this knife blade down fighting technique. Well, Cliff invented that and he had to teach them how to do it. Seagal looks pretty good, but Cliff would make him look amateurish. Now, 
he and I would walk in someplace, and if we wanted most people in there dead, you are dead, even if there's no weapon we brought into the place. You can look around right here, and I see six, seven lethal weapons in this place right now. So what are you going to do about us? You can't register us. That was a fake thing. It came out of uh, Highway Patrol 1954 where somebody was a martial arts expert and Broderick Crawford, who played this Highway Patrol detective, said he had to register his hands, which was crap. That came from Hollywood. So what do you Oh, that's do all BS? I heard that yeah, my whole life about that, people registering. That's BS. <laughs> that's crazy. So what are you going to do with somebody that can easily kill you, fact more reliably kill you without a weapon than with one? So it's like it's not the weapon. It's the character. In other words, if you have manly character, where you don't want that siren going because you want order in your community so that that does not have to occur. Where the people that have the ability to do these things protect and serve their communities, not as police, because the police only clean up the stuff that is not fundamentally done. It, the police comes from the same term that you'd run into if you were ever in the military. All right, gentlemen, we're going to police this area. I don't want to see anything out here. Cigarette butts, trash, I don't want to even see a scrap of hair out of place. The fundamental responsibility for public peace, dignity, and order resides with the community, not the police. The police weren't even invented when the Constitution was ratified in 1789. Uh, uh, the police got invented by Scotland Yard. So Robert Peel, an aristocrat who ran Scotland Yard and he set up the Bobbies, Robert Bobby. That's what they call them now, Bobbies. Constable on patrol, cop. And that came into the United States in the late 1830s and early 1840s in Philadelphia, New York, and some of the eastern cities. This is one of them right here. Before that, that's why you had the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the common defense. In other words, militia was every able-bodied made male from 15 to 60 was responsible for the law and order in his community, whether it was from opposition by Native Americans who didn't like the encroachment on their territory to bandits and other lawless elements. You were supposed to be proficient in weaponry so that you could participate in an organized defense. That came from the English common law where the commoner, the yeoman had to practice with bow and arrow specify, a specified number of times a week. So if the king needed you, you could participate in his royal armies. So if you had a duty, it became a right. If you had a duty to be proficient with archery, you had a right to have the archery tackle that you needed. If you had a duty to participate in a militia, you had a right to possess the weaponry that was necessary. Now, if you have no character, you are a dangerous individual. You can kill all you want if you study and you are a fiend, but the process of teaching is self-regulating because you also teach character in the dojo, not just the art of doing people in. Um, and then there are some people that you have problems with. See, in my experience, the first kill for any human is kind of difficult. Then it gets easier. For some people, it gets entirely too easy. And like training for officers in the Army, um, instruction on who do you pick to go knife a sentry. Don't ever get the person that likes it. Get the family man who's got children, 
who hates the idea but understands the necessity. You see, you have a problem today, which is people don't understand the process of non-lethal combat to work out hierarchical situations to establish dominance. When I grew up, and this is the primary difference between men of my era and what you have right now, is if you got in a fight on the playground, the teachers would walk over very slowly so you could work it out, fight it out, and then before it got out of hand, break it up. And if necessary, refer it to the coach so the fight could continue in the gym. Now, what that meant was, is when you were in the second grade, you knew if a first grader got out of hand, you'd slap him across the head. You, no, you don't do this. If you got out of hand for a third or fourth grader, you're going to get smacked across the head. And if somebody in the second grade did something, you're going to fight about it. So by the time you got to be 11th, 12th grade, you already had inside of you internalized the protocols about how to defuse violence, how to deal with it, how to provoke it when it was absolutely necessary, and you knew the courtesies and the protocols. Nowadays, oh my God, we have to protect everyone from violence, the no, bullies, <coughs> and oh my God, it's up to the parents and the teachers and the police. So you get the police coming on some eight-year-olds. What the hell is that? So they grow up, they don't know how to deal with it, which by the way has got a great deal to do with the police-citizen interaction now. You got cops who are going to be put eventually in a situation where they'll have some physical combat going on because somebody's going to challenge them. Uh, 55 years ago, that challenge would not have occurred because people would have the experience of knowing what was going to happen if you did A and you get B. So if it wasn't worth it, don't provoke it. But now they don't know it, so they artificially provoke it. The cop's never been in a fist fight either. So he's all freaked out. This is his first time. The guy that's getting in a fight with him, this is his first time too. So you see, it's a bad thing. It's body language. Like when I'm talking to you, only 15% of what I'm saying consists of my words. 35% is the tone and 50% is the body language. So here you have people that have no experience with this and Can't they're broadcasting 50 the cents. I'm going to kick your ass. Like, really? Do you know what that means? And then you got sissies that have never been in a fight, have no fighting skills, act like they can kick all kinds of ass and they don't realize what they're doing. Which, by the way, is a problem women have in dealing with men and each other, too. They get put in positions that were heretofore reserved for masculine entities who understood what it was to provoke, what it was to be provoked, and what it was to diffuse. So they get in charge, and it's not that they are a woman. It's just that they're sending all kinds of signals that I'm going to kick your ass and you get this predator that's been here for hundreds of thousands of years that is used to kicking ass as a business. That's his way of earning a living. You hungry? Go kill something. You know, uh, 6,000 pounds worth of something and you got a stick with a rock on the end. You and your buddies are taking it down and you have all these systems of who's watching your back. You know, so we've got these protocols that people don't know how to deal with. So you get manifest violence. I, I, I've stopped in the last few years. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. What the hell is going on here? Is that just your boy? Yeah, this is the guy and this is the cop over here. Y'all got to stop this. What's going on? You broadcasting, you going to kick his ass. He's got a nine millimeter pistol on his hip in a taser, you ain't carrying nothing, and you over here challenging him, you gonna kick his ass, so he's about to get done in because you're gonna have to shoot him or do something to put him in check once you provoke him. What the hell's going on? Huh? They don't even understand it. So you gotta bag him off. All right, bag him off, what's the problem? Well, man, why don't you just go do what he's telling you to do because this is, you know, this is not cool to be doing this. What's your achieving? What's your point? 
Ain't nobody even looking at your dumb ass, you know, and over here, why you want to sit there and challenge him to prove something to yourself? He might kick your ass, take your gun with you, and are you prepared to kill him? Do you know what that means? You know, so back off. Okay, so then you resolve it, and you see, there's none of this going on in the neighborhoods anymore. See, when I grew up in Los Angeles, the cop on the beat, where I was growing up was Tom Bradley. He became mayor of Los Angeles. He big brother, 6'4", going on 6'5", and he used to run high hurdles and 400 meters, went to the Olympics. He tried to get hired as a cop. They would not hire him. He wound up going to law school he had been through Korea, so California passed an act that saying anybody that graduated from an accredited law school in California who was a veteran was sworn into the bar without having to take the bar exam. So now he's a licensed attorney before LAPD would hire him as a cop. So he used to have these meetings with the men in the neighborhood, he and his partner. I can't remember the guy's name. He's a lot shorter. Uh, still a dangerous person. And they'd have these meetings and they'd discuss, well, gentlemen, there's a problem down on 62nd Street and uh, going toward Western. They're getting out of hand. Now, if you gentlemen want to go pay somebody a visit, just let one of us know and we will all be having a meeting. That'll be your alibi. So, you know, don't worry about it if you got to take care of your business. Now, that meant community involvement on keeping the peace. They'd even have meetings with the women. And the women, housewives, maybe, maybe they're made, maybe they work as teachers, it doesn't make any difference they would have these other females they called women of ill repute that the women didn't like. So they would get the same options. This is how you take care of this whole thing. They wouldn't go fight. They put peer pressure on them. So we had community order that came from the people in the community. The police backed that up. But then again, there was a frontier justice because Bradley would see, boy, didn't I tell you to get off this corner? Yes, sir, I see you on one more time, I'm kicking your ass. And Bradley had a reputation of never having lost a race down a back alley to warm somebody's head, and he did that a lot. Community was peaceful, but wasn't anybody getting mad because they understood this was about order where we live, you know. So you had black folk, you know, I used to make a lot of money. There was a guy right down the street. He was the vice principal at a high school. I'd go all the way down and, you know, shine up his black Buick, you know. And then there was another guy that was a, a pharmacist. He was a couple of blocks over, and then somebody next door, he was a janitor, and his wife was a maid. They were cool people. And then right around the corner, one of my homeboys, his man, old man, worked in a factory, and his mama was a nurse. You know, so you had this black community that was tightly knit. We had our fights. We had a problem with gangs, just like you see in Boys in the Hood, where everybody wasn't a part of the gang, but the gangs usually represented boys who did not have a father. Either the mother had a situation or dad got killed in Korea or World War II or something like that. And uh, the funny thing about gang members then was the clowns that were crying for their mama's snot running all out their nose in the fifth grade became super bad in the seventh grade when they joined up with a posse. Now in LA in those days we had Dell Vikings in my neighborhood, Slawsons, De La Soul, businessmen, Bob Town, et cetera, et cetera. Those gangs disappeared about August 1965, and that was because we had an uprising. Watch riots, they call it, August 1965. My girlfriend lived about five blocks from where that crap started. And I remember two, three weeks before it happened, I was 
over there to visit her. And she had gone someplace with her dad. She was coming back, so her mother asked me to go to the corner store to get a loaf of bread or something. I forgot which I did. And as I'm coming out, there's this clown on the corner. Hey, man, where are you from? I said, I'm independent, man. All right, man, you cool. Where are you from, man? I'm from Bobtown. You cool. Where are you from, man? Bobtown. You cool. Where are you from? De La Soul. Where are you from? Businessman. Make your run, MF. Bam, bam. Shot at him three times. Didn't hit him. Three weeks after the riots were over, I did the same thing. I'm running to the store, you know, to get something from my girlfriend's mama. I come back out. Dudes out there. Same two dudes run into each other. Hey, man, you know, like, oh, what you want, man? Man, I want to apologize, man. I didn't know no better, man. Well, that's cool, man. You know, yeah, burn, baby, burn, man. You know, hey, it's all right. Shake hands. All that stopped. And from after the watch riots for the next 18 months, we only had two fatalities in all of South Central L.A. One of them was somebody's wife shot him to death for messing around with another woman. And the other one was somebody's girlfriend shot him to death for messing around with another woman. The rapes dropped to zero. Burglaries dropped to zero. Assaults dropped to zero. The businesses were reporting no shoplifting or theft. And the other thing was, is that business, that convenience store on the corner, it was white owned, but they gave everybody a good deal. So when the riots was going on, black folks stood out in front of the place and say, leave this place alone, they're cool. You see, we had that kind of thing. So you got rid of all of that hostility and aggression. So there was peace. Now, what seemed to have happened was kind of weird. Lyndon Baines Johnson is looked at as a villain right now, but for black people back in the 60s, he was great white daddy in the White House. And he did a lot of things that black folk thought were good for them at the time. Some of the things have backfired, but I don't think it was anybody's intent for them to work out the way they did. And what they were trying to do is end this two society thing where one group of the people in the country were trying to burn down the rest of the damn country. Even if we were a minority, it was causing a lot of property damage. And I can remember standing on a low hill in August when the riot was going on, or the uprising, and I turned around and did a 360. You couldn't see the sun for the black smoke and the flames all around the horizon. It looked like RAF, Army Air Corps had come through and did 24-7 bombing around the place. I mean, it was really a mess. So it wound up being a slum clearance, so to speak. All of the places that were run down, tore down, they got burnt down. And then the community got out there and cleaned up, and we started organizing. But too many people that looked like us became snitches, pimps, hustlers for the movement. And Johnson decided he wasn't going to run, and Tricky Dick got in, and all hope was lost, and we started getting the gangs come up again. Crips, Bloods, Traveling Vice Lords, Gangster Disciples. And I got a slight connection with the Crips which is kind of weird. Cliff, my brother, was playground director at Trinity Avenue Elementary School, which was probably the worst place in the LA City school system at the time. They had run the previous several playground directors off, put one of them in a hospital, turned another one's Volkswagen upside down and set it on fire. So he became the youngest playground director in the LA City school system. So he had me, and a guy named Ron Chappelle, who is Dr. Chappelle now. We were all into the martial arts, and we had a movie star, Tracy Reed, with a fine self, who volunteered, and another fine freak named Vivian Parker. We started putting stuff together, and we got cooperation with everybody in the neighborhood. 
So we set up a radio station. I was the DJ. We were selling hot dogs, Cokes, and everything to raise funds for this. We even got an agreement with a movie distributor to show all of the first run movies. He said- That's what you told me about before when you took the group of kids? Yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right, so anyway, uh, we pulled off a slick one. Rod was the only licensed projectionist, black, in the whole state of California. So the distributor said, you get us a licensed projectionist, and I'll let you have all of these first-run movies the same time the theaters get them. So Rod pulled out his union card. He said, you guys slicked me, didn't you? Yeah. So anyway, one of our students was a skinny 12-year-old on the playground, and the other one was a 14-year-old volunteer. The skinny 12-year-old became Barry White, the singer, now the late one. By the way, they put his age up because of his deep voice. He died of some diabetic complications. We talked to his mama. She got convinced. She let us help him. He came out the swamp. The 14-year-old, his mama wanted to check, so we couldn't get him out of the swamp. But he was one of the co-founders for Crips, the Crips, and he became the last person executed on California's death row. That was Tookie Williams. So Arnold Schwarzenegger should have commuted his sentence to life in the penitentiary after he wrote all these children's books trying to convey what we were teaching him. One of the reasons I think Schwarzenegger didn't is because Tookie and Arnold used to work out at the same goals gym and they used to spot for each other. So it would, let's say, it was embarrassing for the governor of the state of California to have worked out every week and spotted for somebody who was on death row. So I think he wouldn't commute his sentence so took it would go away. Now, What's going on in our neighborhoods now is that there is no effective leadership that can say, follow me. Leadership is essentially something that requires a war leader, or if not a war leader who can lead men in the combat or on the hunt, or if not that, somebody that can lead the war leaders might be a wise person or something. We don't have that. As I alluded to earlier, there's nobody out there that can say, follow me and everybody will go. They can sit at a desk and they can have programs where the money for the programs gets funneled to friends but nobody that really knows what's going on, nobody that can deal with the streets. And what happens in the streets is what's happening in Haiti right now, which is you get the gangs which become capable of manifesting physical authority. Based on your experience and observation of human behavior, right, are people corrupt before they get political power? Or does the political power and political environment encourage certain behaviors we would label as corruption? Well, it's kind of like entrapment is a legal defense. Did you just provide somebody with a mechanism to commit crime that they were disposed to commit, or did you actually induce them to commit the crime? In my experience, and this goes back a long time since I'm 76 years old, and I've been in political stuff since I've been 15 or 16. Dishonest people tend to like politics because it's so easy to do corrupt and wrong things and get a lot of money or power out of it. But then you have people who get into politics as a matter of principle. If you want to see politics in its raw form, go to the zoo, go to the primate house, and watch the baboons and the chimpanzees, not the gorillas. They've got a different thing going. But watch the chimps 
in the baboons. You can see them off in the bushes or the shadows playing politics. And essentially what it is, is they're fighting to see who's gonna be between the threat to the pack and the pack. The leopard's out there, so they gotta be between the leopard and the people that they are leaders for. Now that kind of leadership's okay but you have some people who do not possess that, but they get into power, so they get cloaked with authority that they do not have personally. There are people that walk into a room and they'll soon dominate that room. That's just because they have it. And other people who wish they had it, who can cloak themselves with the authority of an office or a position. They tend to be very bad because they're trying to prove something to themselves rather than using the position to do what they are in the position for, which is lead for the benefit of the pack. Most politicians try to be honest except for the fact that they have to deal with other people. In our system, we have a, a thing called the people get the representation they deserve. If the reputation, representation isn't crap, that's because the people aren't crap. If the people want good representation, they need to get themselves together. Now, the last election cycle we had, we, I did an interview with some of the people involved. It was take your booties to the pole. So we've got a bunch of strippers on a pole, a third of which weren't even women, they were trannies sitting up there showing bare butts and that's supposed to get a black man to the pole to vote. Like if you were that dumb and that's how you respond, you don't need the damn vote. Okay, but that kind of insulting attitude towards you is what's supposed to work. Have you ever noticed, speaking of such things, how when they want to appeal to black folk, they always have us dancing, a line dance out in front of a pole. Like, what is the black folk contribution to America? Hip hop, it's not a contribution, that's a distraction. In other words, if it's a contribution, you can say, if the, but for this, something wouldn't be as good as it is now. So where would we be without hip hop? Same place you are with it. You know, so we've got this idea now where instead of accomplishment, we look at distraction as being an accomplishment. We focus on Hollywood. We focus on the entertainment industry. And I'm not saying that there are not conscientious entertainers who know something that's going on. And I know some that are very smart and keep up on stuff, but most of them have spent their entire adult lives concentrating on distraction. Concentrating on making the dollar distracting people. And if you don't get it, Julius Caesar 2,080 some years ago told Mark Anthony when he had been made by the Roman Senate dictator for life, Mark Anthony is supposed to have asked him, Caesar, what do you think the Roman mob is going to say with you being dictator for life? He said, give them bread and circuses and they won't care. The Latin phrase is done pane is Um Give them bread and circuses, feed them and entertain them and they won't give a damn. And when you have people who for their whole adult lives I've been into the entertainment phase, so people get distracted. It gets really weird when you let that kind of person dictate to you your realities. Please explain what's going on in Haiti right now. Okay. You have Toussaint Louverture, who was governor general of Saint Dominique. The islanders, once they got free, did not like St. Dominique, so now it's called Haiti. All right, Haiti got into a situation where it borrowed money from France under Napoleon III, all right? They had problems paying it back, but that really wasn't a big problem. France wasn't about to come in and invade Haiti. What happened was, is you had a, 
upset in Washington, D.C. in 1919 where blacks killed more whites in an uprising than whites killed blacks. This is in the 123 places that got burnt up, destroyed, or otherwise harmed by racism in America, but it went the other way around. You had black veterans on the roofs of tenements who had just gotten back from the trenches. Black Pullman car porters smuggled in guns from Baltimore. They armed up, they killed a lot of white folk. The Woodrow Wilson administration literally called in the cavalry to bestow order. You had Haitians coming into Harlem and they were spreading this idea of black independence, black self-help, black power and you had Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois contributing to this. What the Wilson administration did was put in place a situation where they literally invaded Haiti, sent in the Marines. They didn't just send in any Marines. They wanted them from Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Arkansas, North Carolina, et cetera, good Southern boys who knew how to treat a Negro. And they abused the Haitians mightily. They set up a situation where Papa Doc came to power. He was a physician, did some good work, but he also used voodoo and some other mind games to get control and he became a very vicious person in large part due to the reaction to the way he and his people were getting treated by the United States Marine Corps during the period of time they occupied Haiti. Remember the objective is is to keep the Haitians from infecting the American Negro with these ideas of self-sufficiency and independence. All right, you wind up getting baby doc and a bunch of sick mess, and then you get this Haitian earthquake that comes into play. You get Hillary Clinton exercising some initiative to get personal gain out of the Haitian circumstances. You get an effort by the current Democratic Party regime to protect her from the consequences so it's unspoken. In the last decade, many celebrities have been accused of committing some very disturbing acts, right? Uh, recently, there have been numerous allegations against Diddy. The question I have is, right, uh, are people who witnessed these illegal actions or abuses for a certain period of time and failed to intervene or report, can they also be charged? It's called misprison of a felony. Misprison of a felony is a common law crime. It's a felony. What happens is that there is a thing in American and English law called prosecutorial discretion. Prosecutors have an absolute unquestioned authority to decline to prosecute. And for the most part, they have declined to prosecute those people who are not on an unfavored list when it comes to concealing felonies. So you have to look at your prosecutorial authority in a given area. If it's federal, you can blame the presidential administration for that. If it is local, you can blame yourself for voting for it. The district attorney chip for a state is generally, just about all 50 of the states, a constitutional provision, uh, position that is subject to popular election. The district attorney general, district attorney, DA or DAG, is also usually a constitutional position and is elected. So if you got a screwed up district attorney, You've got a screwed up population that's voting for somebody that they should not have voted in the office. And generally what happens is nobody knows anything about the DAs uh, because it's not just a TV series, Law and Order. 
they walk up to a poll and they get a sample ballot handed to them by representatives of somebody with some kind of political credibility and they vote those ballots rather than what they know. They can tell you about the NBA, NFL, MLB, hockey, whatever it may be, tennis, but they can't deal with what impacts their tomorrow, whether they get out of jail, stay in jail, who goes to jail, who gets prosecuted. It's all kinds of mythology. It's white supremacy. No, it's not. That's why right now black folk have such an enormous impact on the political process. Why everybody's concerned with whether or not black men are switching over to support Donald Trump. You see, there is tremendous power there. You talk about the Jewish population, but there are more black folk than there are Jew folk in the country. We have an enormous amount of money that we spend, but we don't spend wisely because we're too caught up in showing things and in appearances rather than in realities. All right, now, um, that said, let's go back to Fannie Willis again. She's chief prosecutor for Atlanta, Fulton County. There are two counties in Atlanta, Fulton and Cobb. Cobb is one of the most racist in America right now, but it's a big slice of Atlanta. The other one is Fulton. Fulton, North Fulton, after whom, after which the county is named, is almost 80, 90 percent black, but it's manifest corruption. And that's because black folk get these positions and instead of being dedicated to their people, they're dedicated to how do I get wealthy? How do I get from lower middle class to being wealthy? And that works for white folk too. You got a president, Joe Biden, who is a multimillionaire and guess what? You have to ask yourself the question, how do you become a multimillionaire and you've never gotten anything but a government paycheck your entire adult life? You see, there are opportunities to get filthy rich off of what's going on. They might range from, okay, contract kickbacks to outright scams that you can go to jail for, easily go to jail for. But what happens when somebody says, we have a unique situation. We have a group of people that can be counted on to vote a certain way, even if they get nothing out of the deal because they've been convinced, although almost as though it's a religion, that they have to vote this way. So they get caught up in a situation where no matter what a party, this particular party, does not do for the black folk that vote for them, it doesn't change the outcome. And when you get to the other party, no matter what they think about doing for black folk, they don't get a vote. That means that neither has an incentive to court the black vote. So we get absolutely nothing out of it. And you get people talking about somebody's a racist. It doesn't make any damn difference whether somebody's a racist or not when it comes to politics, if you get the bargain. In other words, okay, he's a racist, she's a racist. What do we get out of the deal? Do we get more out of this? in terms of what our children get, the next generation. Remember, what do you see when you see a human, a successful screw? What do our successful screws get so they get a good screw so our grandchildren are cool, all right? What do, what do I get in terms of what I get paid for the work I do? What do I get in terms of my retirement benefits? What do I get in terms of what I'm looking for when I retire? Uh, for example, what's happening with Medicare? I just ran into a spectacle. I waited until I was 76 to go on Medicare instead of having the government pay for my medical needs. I had a group plan. So if I joined Medicare at 65, I would be paying $174.97 primary Medicare cost. Now that I waited, I have to pay $387.97 plus 
plus an additional several hundred dollars penalty for not getting in the thing when I turn 65. And then I have to get something to pick up to 20%, which is $380 a month. So instead of having a group plan, which has a yearly cost of $1,670, I've got a bill now for $15,600 just to get Medicare. So what the hell's going on when I'm sitting here looking like people who are fool enough to vote for somebody that's got it so when you're dumb behind turns 65 years old, you have some elections. And when you get the elections as to your personal choices, whether you get an insurance program that'll reasonably take care of you or when you get through paying the deductible, you get a real live mess. Now I'm retired. I'm not bad off because I made what I made from Hollywood, but I went from paying a copay for the medications I get from being a type two diabetic that keep me in great health. I went from paying about four or $500 deductible to $3,000 a month for the deductible on this doggone thing or the copay. What the hell is that? And I'll be 77 in a few weeks or months. So what are we doing when we put that kind of thing in play? That has nothing to do with race. But that's what we wind up getting when we don't think. We talk about Obamacare. Like hell, Dr. Bill Frist of Nashville, Tennessee. Senior Republican United States Senator from the sovereign state of Tennessee who became Republican Senate Majority Leader in 2003 drafted Affordable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act. His family founded Blue Cross Blue Shield and controls most of the HMOs and medical insurance companies in America. When Obama's trust fund operating out of Indonesia invested heavily in Blue Cross in 2009, in 2010, he sponsored Bill Frist's proposed legislation that he couldn't get passed. Now it's known as Obamacare. We got a Negro in there that we supported who put in place something that is absolutely ridiculous. If you look at it, you get a situation where if you get one medication I had, the copay per month on a 30-day prescription was $482 and some cents. $400 for a copay? $482 for a copay. For one medication? One medication. It's a lot of fire. But if I got a 90-day supply, the copay for 90 days worth wasn't but $19. Now, why? When you read the act, you find out that the medical insurance company, Blue Cross, Blue Shield is what his family founded, they get benefit of your copay, they get benefit of your insurance premium, and they get 100% reimbursement by the U.S. government. Why doesn't the U.S. government just pay for you since they're paying the exact same amount of money out to a medical insurance company, but you have to pay the premium which the insurance company also gets, and you have to pay the copay, which they get benefit of. So why don't you save the American public that insurance premium and that copay, and instead of playing Blue Cross, you pay it directly to the citizen or on behalf of the citizen? Yeah. You see, why do we go there and we get all happy and we've never read the damn thing? Why do we elect officials who have never read the damn thing? They had a, uh, the bailout under Bush was $700 billion to the failed investment firms, et cetera, et cetera, that had gone into a bad situation with those mortgage bundling things. Under the Obama administration, $781 billion. And then what happened is when we had the bailout under that, we had 43 representatives and senators who signed the letter demanding that the U.S. Attorney General investigate why the bailout funds were being used to pay the bonuses for these failed executives who were responsible. 
Well, what the dips didn't realize was that they had signed off on provisions that were in the affordable care thing that said, not the affordable care, but the bailout provisions that said the federal money could be used to pay for the bonuses of the failed executives. Geithner drafted that. Geithner was the chief uh, advisor for a lot of the investment industry. Geithner was also the secretary of the treasury. That means he was over IRS. Less than a year prior to him becoming Treasury Secretary, he had pled guilty to tax evasion in the tune of $28 million, been put on six months probation and paid a 28000 no, he paid a fine and he got six months suspended. Wesley Snipes got found guilty of three misdemeanors, failure to file a complete set of returns, and he got three years in a federal penitentiary. So why does the Treasury Secretary get a suspended sentence, a $42,000 fine, for tax fraud in the amount of $28 million. And then he gets put in charge of IRS less than a year later. The question I have then is like, uh, when did special education become so profitable? And how are these profits hurting the youth's education in America? Okay, here's what's happening. It costs basically 10 or 12 times as much to do special education per student as it does for the regular track. So every time you get a special ed student, what you're doing is you're cutting back on what 12 other students get. Now, one of the things that's going on is too often what happens in the home place is something that's very bad. The children are not getting prepared to deal with life because what's going on in their home is not somebody sitting down and saying, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna sit here with you at the kitchen table. You're gonna do your homework. Somebody's just saying, oh, do what the hell you wanna do. I don't care, it's not my fault. There's a white supremacy thing going on. There's a white man sitting on the other side of my kids' kitchen table interfering with them. So you get a lot of people that aren't really special education material but wind up getting treated as that. And also, it's like a couch potato. If a person just sits on the couch and doesn't do anything physical, they get real physically flabby. If you let somebody sit around and not develop their mind in the crucial formative years, they get mentally flabby and they may become special ed because somebody at home has not been doing what they needed to do to develop that child's mind and give them the necessary step-by-step -step foundation. So special education becomes very profitable for systems when you get corruption on the boards of education. Right now in Memphis Shelby County, we have all sorts of problems going on right now that are getting exposed that have to do with corruption. Special education budgets are getting diverted for other purposes. You see, you have stuff where let's say a contract with a supplier or a service provider is under $100,000. It doesn't have to be ruled on by the whole board when you have a large board of education. But if you have 10 separate contracts during a year, that's a million dollars, which is significant, but none of them had to be reviewed. So a lot of the funds that would be going for special education are used to furnish the wherewithal for these other programs that somebody on the board get stuff under the table on. We had 
at least one conscientious lady on the Memphis or the Shelby County Board of Education to resign. She said, I can no longer be part of this ignorance and corruption that is going on right here. So it's become endemic in the school system. Look at Chicago. 25 years ago, Chicago had one of the best public school systems in the country. Nobody sent their kids to private school because the public school was so excellent. Now look what's happened to it. It's out of control because it becomes a means for the unscrupulous at the expense of the children to get money that goes in their bank accounts or in their cookie jars so they can spend cash on it. So uh, I just want to understand, if you increase the population of special ed children, obviously you increase the funding, but the funding is not being used for special ed That's children. Right. It's abusing elsewhere. Yeah. That makes sense because personally I witnessed where like, Special ed children weren't receiving the services their IEP says they're supposed to get. No, they're not. So who's getting it? And plus the other thing is, are you hiring extra teachers to handle it? You're not. See, so where exactly are you supposed to provide for this? You have how many hours a day that the students stay in there? The ones that come in on the regular bus or the ones that come in on the short bus? So the ones that come in on the short bus don't have extra teachers brought into the schools. They've got the same teachers. And oftentimes you've got the special ed students in the same classrooms with the regular track students. So what are you doing? You got extra money, but no extra teachers, no extra classrooms. So all of the rest of the students have to be held back because of the special ed students but, who are in there. And it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Judge, as an educated man like yourself, right, especially a person with experience in education, where did they get this theory that if you put a, a, a student who's struggling in their academics with other kids, they're going to boost up? Where did this idea come from? Because it seems like they... Well, it, it's popular. In other words... Uh, by example, it can work, but not the way they do it. We had uh, a junior college that had extra um, classroom space. So what they wound up doing with this junior college is they opened up a special high school where the high school students would attend class inside the junior college. So I remember in the 90s, I used to go over there and lecture. And I remember I was walking down the hallway and I had to stop and watch this. This young man was trying to talk to this sister who was leaning up against the doorway to go wait for her class to start. She was fine. She had a nice legs, face, and body, everything. Yeah, mama. said. So she said, wait, just stop. Stop. She said, look, one, you're too young. Two, if you want somebody like me, everybody in here is trying to get their thing together. That's why we're going to college. And you're in here acting like a dip, a fool. Do you really expect one of us to pay attention to you? Well, no. So if you wanted somebody like me, go get your stuff together. I'm watching you around the hallways act the clown. Do you think I'm supposed to be responding to that? So what wound up happening before they ended this experiment is an extremely high number of these students who were there because they had been disciplinary problems in other high schools wound up getting scholarships, grants, aids, and went on and got graduate degrees, postgraduate degrees, an enormous number. But for some reason, they cut it down and they stopped it. So that is an example of taking smart kids who were behavioral problems and putting them in a place where they're surrounded by adults who are trying to do something positive. That works. All right. Now, if you take somebody where it is a, isn't a motivational thing, it is a capacity thing, you are defeating your purposes because it doesn't work. So. This also comes into play where you have cities where somebody has decided to tear down public housing and build low income housing. The building of the low income housing provides a financial opportunity for certain people who are on the end, 
who are anxiously trying to get opportunities to build something at the public expense. They make money off of that. Usually what they build has no real utility or use for the public. It's just built because it's an excuse for them to make money. One of the things they do is to get the political group, the city council, the board of aldermen, the county commissioners, the mayor, to want to tear down public housing and build low-income housing. When they build the low-income housing, traditionally what they do is they do not build enough replacement units to house everybody that was in public housing. So their excuse is the same thing. If we take these people who've been clowning and breaking the law and taking them out someplace where they're respectable law-abiding people, they'll act better. Like hell, they continue the lawlessness and you drive these people out. Memphis is probably the largest major, uh, predominantly black city in America. So we had a mayor that did that 30 years ago. And all of these folk that left went into black middle class areas and the folk there said, oh, hell no. And they moved out of Memphis, which cost the tax base. And they moved to some of the suburbs. Now one of the suburbs that 20 years ago used to be a good place to live is now known as Drug City, you see. And like the place I live, damn near every house is at minimum a million and it goes up. They put in low to moderate income housing with a big Section 8 contingent to handle some of what's still floating around loose and non-housed from 30 years ago, the tail end of that, some of those successful screws. And in this one unit that used to be agriculturally zoned, the developers paid each of the aldermen in a place called Germantown $18,000 before we had restrictions on how much corporate entities could put up. They each got $18,000 contributed toward their election funds. They gave a zoning variance. So they've got a, an apartment complex for low to moderate income with a high Section 8 population. And in the last 18 months, we've had seven shootings over there, just in this one complex right down the street about a 10 minute walk from the upscale housing. And what do you think that's going to do to people that are black, white, brown, red, yellow saying, hell no, I don't want this going on in the neighborhood. Nobody was locking the back doors or the front doors. Everything was peaceful. There was uh, about seven burglary attempts 20 years ago and they caught the people. Uh, nobody got successfully burglarized, they just tried. So that's the only crime in the area. And now all of these burglaries going on. See, so what are you doing when you don't deal with controlling your situation and your primary interest is the select group that are into typically five things, real estate acquisition or control of the real estate, real estate management and development. The development says, we want to get a zoning variant so we can build low-income housing on this. Or we want to turn it into a commercial zone when it's zoned for residential. We bribe the county commissioners and the city council. Then the city council or the county commission contracts with us so we can build it. So we get a great deal of money for building this thing and we also supply the construction material so we get that too. So you build this thing that nobody needs, it's a white elephant and you wind up getting a lot of money going into the pockets of the people. Now, they even have artful ways of financing this. Uh, about 34 years ago, we had uh, a thing called Mud Island Development in Memphis. It was real upscale housing development, still is. And under the regulations, the developer had to donate his own land to build roads on to handle the population density of his development. 
and pay for the roads. Well, he didn't want to do that. So what he wanted to do was get the city to exercise him in the domain, pay him for the property that he had the rights to, that they would take for the roads and then pay for the road construction. So he didn't bribe them, this is what he did. They sold him a corner with a stop side on it for $13,600. 90 days later, he sold that corner back to the city for $6.8 million and he used that profit to pay off the city council, the county commissioners, and himself. So he didn't even have to pay any money out of pocket. See, there are all kinds of things like that that are done. And if you look into what's happening in your big cities, this one included, Baltimore, uh, Chicago, you will find a whole lot of things like that. What's the future uh, historically about colleges? Because I know there's a struggle in regards to recruiting talent but also financially, uh, many of them seem to be in problems as well as losing their accreditation. Yeah, that's the thing. See, what'll save them accreditation wise is like, go look at Howard. My old man went there back in the 40s. All right, I had to deal with Howard about 50 some years ago when I was uh, doing this intern thing with a DC think tank operating out of Catholic University. I finished up law school essentially. So what you had was a place that was comfortable to black students at a time when ordinary black students couldn't get in the mainstream stuff, but the exceptional ones could. So the college education, which was important and not so much what you got taught in terms of specific who did this, when, where, but a means of a mode, manner, and fashion of thinking critically, analytically, logically, rationally, objectively. And that's what the college education was about. It served a viable and valuable function to black communities. Now, if you go to Howard, it's almost it's rainbow right now, good, more power to them, but it's not into a black thing now, it's a rainbow thing. And also you see everybody on that campus because you no longer can have anything that specializes in one race or ethnicity. It's got to be anybody that wants to come in can come in, and that's what you're getting at historical black colleges and universities. They may be historically black, but when you look at them, anybody that can afford to go there is trying to go because they want that college degree, which opens up a lot of earning for them later in life. So it's not so much black anymore. It's something that at one time used to be, like a lot of these other institutions were historically white. Now, there are problems. UCLA, for example, has got more than a hundred some thousand full-time students. When I went there, entered 1965, they had 62,000 full-time students and we had 145 full-time black students. 73 full-time black grad students and 72 full-time black undergrads. We knew each other. We did some things, a lot of us, we all wound up getting locked up in a jail cell a time or two. Even the vice chancellor of UCLA, who was a black man, he wound up being the acting chancellor at one point in time. Even they locked him up. And we opened this place up and we got a commitment for a block of 250 black students for 67, 66, 67 and another 250 for 67, 68. The second bunch were not committed like the first bunch where, brother, we gotta go make a move. They don't have anybody in the econ department. Let's go. Uh, brothers, excuse me. Uh, it's not that I don't appreciate what you've done for me and all of the sacrifices, but I can't afford to jeopardize my career. So you'll have to go on without me, but I'll be there in spirit. Grab that Negro, let's go. All right, you see, we wound up with this thing. If it's too easy to get, it's not appreciated. We have too many black students 
who got in places that they could not have gotten into with the amount of effort that they had put forth in high school 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And they get in under these programs or because of relaxed admission. So they're used to coasting. And they're not used to making a stand of saying, oh, hell no, this is not going down this way. And they get in positions, and what they wind up doing is essentially having an ambition to be in a cotillion scene for Atlanta housewives rather than doing something <laughs> that might impact the black community. <laughs> I say that literally. Um, you get a situation like Memphis again. We have white supremacy causing black folk to be done in by the police department. But the black folk, uh, well, the police department is 75% black. 60% of the cops grew up in Memphis. Almost 80% of the command authority for the police department is black. The chief is a black female. Same thing with the sheriff's department. It's a black male who is the sheriff. The same thing with the majority of the deputies being black and the majority of the command authority being black. 60% of the criminal court judges are black and female. And you've got 75% of the jury pool is black. Now, how in the hell are you going to have white supremacy operating the damn place when the mayor of the city is black, the county mayor is black, the city council is majority black, and the county commission is majority black. Where the hell did white supremacy come in here? But they blame white supremacy because people have this Pavlovian response. The bell rings and the dog salivates because it's been conditioned that way. And the black folk in Memphis talk about white supremacy when they actually run the damn place. It's just their leadership is corrupt. Uh, majority of people who graduate college, they're in a position where they're not making a livable wage and they're unable to, I guess, uh, keep up with their Don't get me started. student loan repayment. But the question I have is two sides, like the sustainability of the student loan business for banks. OK, let me explain what you're looking at. A lot of people saying this administration helped us out by canceling the loans. No, they didn't cancel the loans. They just made it so the government pays to the lending institutions the entire balance that you owe plus the interest, not after you paid it off after 10 years, but all at one time. It saves the lending institution the cost of collection, the attorney fees, the court cost, tracking you down, dealing with trying to levy on your accounts over a number of years, to get repaid, they get it all at one time, all of their interest at one time. They don't have to wait 10 years, they get it now. The next thing is embarrassing. The cutoff is $125,000. If you make less than that, you're eligible. If you make more than that, you're not. The tragedy of the situation is middle class in the United States starts at 125,000 and goes up. So that means you're not even middle class, middle, middle class. It means you're something less. Anywhere else in the whole planet world, any on the planet Earth, if you've got a four year college degree, you're guaranteed to be at least middle class. But in America, you're not. So in other words, you just got chumped off because the bottom line is, is if you had 125,000 a year income, which is commensurate with this education you supposedly have, you'd be all right. But they're telling you, you don't. So you ain't doing what you supposed to be doing or you can't. And it's like going to law school. 75% of the people that graduate from law school do not practice law because there's no employment available. And most of them aren't making what they need to even pay off their loans for going to law school. As a consequence, we have a surplus of lawyers who charge exorbitant fees because they don't have the volume to keep the doors open. So they're charging high fees for little work. You have a situation with that, and that's a good example of what's going on. Like, would you go to a doctor's office 
if somebody referred you to a doctor and you found out that this doctor had never done an internship and never done a residency at a hospital, so yeah. everything he got was straight out of the books, well, that's what's happening in law right now. You have people who are known as prominent civil rights lawyers and they've never tried a jury trial in their entire careers. You got people like me who tried thousands of cases as a lawyer, let alone as a judge. And then you've got senior members of firms, white and black, who had five cases they've tried in 25 years. Hell, you're still a rookie. We had a DA in Memphis and uh, I was on the bench, two and a half hours late for a swearing in. You know why? He'd never been to the criminal justice center and had no idea it. where it is. So he's a DA. We had one person, a woman, who put her husband through law school. He graduated, he supported her. She went to law school, she graduated, took the bar, got sworn in four days after she was sworn into the bar, she was appointed a superior court judge, unlimited trial jurisdiction, so the biggest rookie in the whole damn court was the judge who had never set foot in the courtroom until she was sworn in as the judge. Less than a year and a half, wait a minute, out of law school, she got made a federal judge, and it's not because she was a great scholar, it was just political. So now you got a judge over a federal court that can declare acts of Congress unconstitutional, stay actions of presidents, and they're 18 months out of law school and never practice law. I wanted to touch back with the student loan, right? Like in regards to the morale of the society, isn't it like damaging when you have a whole generation that has an idea that um, if I go to college, there's no benefit because obviously they have family members. Yeah, in that's the past. a problem because you lo lose out on that rational, reasonable, analytical, objective, detached thought and analysis. You see, that's what they really teach you in college is how to do that. And then it's compounded because now schools are just too damn easy. They are not rigorous. Um, people say, wow, you learned that in law school? No, I learned that in the fifth grade. <laughs> you know, like what? They used to teach us that in the fifth grade. You know, when I was teaching as a substitute, I taught my fifth graders that, but I didn't like teaching elementary, I prefer junior high and high school. So why is it that 50 years ago you're getting this in the fifth and sixth grade and now you don't even get it in college? What's going on with this picture? Because, oh, it's so difficult, the children will be disappointed. Oh, they should have a certificate of attendance even if they don't get a diploma. No, keep your dumb bunny ass off the stage. You didn't graduate. You don't get to walk across like fronting off like you did because your feelings got hurt. Hurt your damn feelings. Next time you'll try harder. When did participation certificates start? What year was that? I remember I was on the Title I committee for well, this Board of Education in Memphis in 1974. And there was this big pressure then about these children really want it, but well, what have they done? Well, they're participating. Well, so damn what did they achieve? Well, it's not fair to them for their hopes to be dashed. Well, what hopes do they have? They don't have a damn high school diploma. They've got a certificate of attendance. Well, they participated. You see, that was the thing because we were getting something that started about 50 years ago, literally that said you do not want to impact the child's self-esteem by saying you didn't make it, you failed. Well, you know, the real world used to be a place where if you failed, something ate your ass up and you had a good snack, you know, or a good meal, tender, you know. Um, it meant somebody killed you. It meant you were in poverty. But you see this entitlement thing 
was supposed to be helpful, but the entitlement thing backfired because the world does not work on a participation ribbon basis. You know, they don't learn how to be in charge because everybody gets the participation ribbon, but as soon as you get out of high school, you're dumped into this highly competitive world. And nobody has taught you how to compete. You're 18 years old now, and you don't know what competition is. Child support, and you've been a judge, right? Is child support even about the child anymore? Uh, my ex-wife, first one, I've been divorced 30-some years. Okay. Um, what happened was the child support I was paying, which was five times what I was ordered, she took the child support, and instead of using it for child support, she set up a retirement fund for herself, unbeknownst to anybody. So she's making at least three times as much from retirement income as she was getting from a paycheck. She was lazy. She liked to smoke that reefer. And at 64 years old, she was making about 35000 a year, which is an embarrassment because that wasn't any more than she was making when I met her back in the early 1980s. So the children got deprived, but the child support was not used for the kids, it was used for her. Now some states have put a limit on the absolute amount of child support. They said that a wealthy child is no more valuable than a middle class child than a poor child. So there is a maximum that can be put to functional use for child support. So some states now have a cutoff point that you just don't get any more than that for child support for the specified purpose of preventing the child support for being used as unofficial spousal support or alimony. Now, usually what happens is the guy who goes through a divorce winds up with more control over his circumstances than somebody who has the kid out of wedlock. Explain. Okay. When you have the kid out of wedlock, basically all they're doing is trying to keep the state from having to pay out. A lot of juvenile court systems have become privatized and they become sources of income for the municipality or the county or for the investors in the enterprise thing. So they have an interest in maintaining future business. So if they F up the family situation, they produce future business. If they correct bad family situations, they lose future business. So since they're money-making propositions, they don't help things out. If you're going through a divorce, you don't usually get stuck through somebody's juvenile or domestic system. You deal with a circuit, a superior, or a chance record type situation that has rules that it applies. So there is an incentive to screw somebody over for political and social reasons. In other words, a lot of elected officials are they can't, they can't keep their dick in their pants. So they got a lot of outside kids. And they get blackmailed because the kids are not the product of a marital unit. It's some side action. So they get extorted. Okay. A lot of people are dangerous when they get independent. Just ordinary people. So what winds up happening is... If I keep this guy down, we don't have to worry about him politically. Uh, he's not going to be a good voter. He's going to be angry. He'll keep himself in a situation where it will be very easy to put him in a warehouse, meaning a penitentiary. I ran that down earlier. And it's a means of control. Uh, 
I've stumbled on instances where if you've got a chance to look at the records, you'll find that a state senator has 20, 25 outside children through a uh, juvenile court having something to do with him, a congressman having 10, 12, 14, 15 outside children. So what kind of independence is he giving you when he is subject to getting badly embarrassed by getting snatched through a juvenile court. You see, you have mayors who have outside children who are blackmailed into being compliant and complacent and doing what they're told to do so the embarrassment doesn't come to light. You have all of these things going on. You have another thing where it is just and it's not so bad now that you have DNA tests, but you have a tradition that developed before these viable DNA tests where uh, I don't care whether he looks like you now, you feed him long enough, he'll look just like you. And it's a way of keeping certain communities in check, poor white communities, poor black communities, brown ones, red ones, whatever it may be. It's a means of social control, political control. So child support is used for that purpose. Also, what usually winds up happening is when these corrupt systems get the child support, they don't immediately tender it to the woman. They keep it for months to earn interest on it. The interest just disappears for other purposes. And then the woman gets the child support. A lot of times the child support is designed to keep a family down. In other words, the guy can afford to pay it, they make the woman suffer. If the guy can't afford to pay it, then they are going to uh, break him so he does not get able to pay it. Used to be you could grow out of it. In other words, might be ruinous to pay child support, whatever, when you're 29, 32, 34 years old, but as you get older, your income increases, so it might not be any big thing by the time you get in your mid-40s. But now they have methods for automatically ramping it up so somebody stays behind the eight ball. That's the part I don't understand. Like, if you're taking so much of this man's income that he can't survive, that's the purpose. <laughs> like, how is that beneficial to you being a father? It's not. If you're not a good father, you generate juvenile delinquents or juvenile delinquency. These privatized juvenile systems then make money on incarcerating the juveniles. You have to start looking at what they're getting. No, I, I understand that part, right? But that's what they want to do. See, they want to maintain a condition of helplessness within certain impacted communities. They don't want them to be viable in terms of actually exercising power. And uh, another question I have too, man, is just like, uh, why are women allowed to just like have free reign? Because it all, it's almost like mental abuse in a sense, how they deal with the child compared oh, yeah. to, a, to a husband. So like, why aren't there any laws that clearly states that uh, you, using the child or uh, a next thing is denying men access to the child. Well, see, that's the other thing too. Every state has the same rule on that. And there is an interstate compact on uniform child support. A woman can't cut off visitation for non-payment of child support. They think they can. But the law in just about every state forbids that because the interest of the child is supposed to be paramount and the input from the father is important. A lot of places turn a blind eye to that and a lot of women don't know that. And they do it and the guy doesn't want to be bothered with going to court anyway because it's not healthy to be down there. So no, that's not appropriate, but they get away with it. And then there's this thing again, I talked about prosecutorial discretion. The prosecutors in an area, in a district could get involved, but they generally don't because they count on women going out to vote. 